Welcome to Middle School Science Module 6, Ecosystems, Interactions, Energy, and Dynamics. For Praxis Preparation, this is in partnership with TLC Tutoring Company and Arkansas State University. Let's start with just the concept of ecosystems. So an ecosystem consists of all the organisms and the physical environment in which they interact. It's important to note that it's not just the living things and not just the non-living things, it's everything together. So ecosystems result from independent members and while they are resilient, they can be affected by outside factors or even population growth. Generally speaking, as a population within an ecosystem grows, consider a pond with ducks living on it. As you have more and more ducks, its consumption of natural resources increases. It puts more pressure on the ecosystem. If the resources are limited, competition between different organisms puts pressure on the population and constrains their growth. At a certain point, you can't put any more ducks in the pond, right? So these balances have to be maintained carefully and observed closely, as humans have the greatest impacts on ecosystems. Because of our technology and our large population, we're able to affect ecosystems in ways that other creatures just are not. So it's one of these things that we have to be aware of and that we're going to spend more time on in this module. Now, ecosystems have cycles within them because we've talked about that matter and energy are both conserved. That means they can neither be created nor destroyed. They can only be changed. Because of that, matter and energy are constantly cycled through all the organisms in an ecosystem. Now, generally, you have three kinds of organisms within an ecosystem, and this is what the matter and the energy pass through. So, first of all, you have producers. These are generally plants and other organisms that engage in photosynthesis. They literally take sun energy and make things out of it. So generally, they're making sugars, they're making starches. They're doing all that and storing it for future use. So they literally are producing that, um, that food material. Then you have consumers. Consumers don't create anything directly. They consume energy made by plants or other producers. So these organisms feed on them. Then you have secondary consumers that feed on primary consumers and tertiary consumers that feed on secondary consumers. So, you know, you might have a cow that eats, eats grass and then, you know, a human that eats the cow, you know, or, and it can be obviously much more complicated than that, but that's the simplest idea of consumers. You know, then there's the great equalizer, the decomposers. So there are organisms, typically bacteria and fungi, that carry out the process of decomposition, which all living things undergo after death. After death, we have to break down the, um, the body that is left over when an organism dies. So this allows that organic material that was in that, in that body to be recycled in, in an ecosystem and reused again, because this cycles back into the soil or released into the air, which then goes back into the producers and you end up with a cycle. Now, one model that is typically used, and especially that we talk with students about, is the food web model, is that the interactions between producers, consumers, and decomposers are complex. It's not straight lines, and it can be hard to visualize. So the food web model gives, shows the interlocking food chains. Now, this web shows that producers feed multiple consumers. You can see that the grass is feeding the grasshopper, and the antelope, as well as the rhinoceros, very different animals that the rhinoceros could eat the tree or it could eat the grass, but the giraffe only eats the tree. So you see how it can get very complicated. And then the secondary consumers, you know, the, the birds who eat the grasshoppers, the lions who eat the, you know, eat the giraffes and so on and so forth. Energy enters the web through sunlight to the producers. That energy and matter flows through the web eventually going back to decomposers, back into the ground, and back into the plants. Now, in the same way, because we've been cycling energy, we also have to cycle atoms as far as the matter itself. So, since all matter is composed of atoms, some atoms can be a part of a plant one day and an animal the next day and travel downstream as part of a river's water the following day. These atoms can be part of living things like plants and animals, as well as non-living things like water and air and even just rocks sitting around. The same atoms are recycled over and over and over again in different parts of the earth. 
This type of cycle of atoms between living and non-living things is called the biogeochemical cycle, which that's a fun, that's a fun phrase to, to spit out. But that cycle shows that all matter is constantly being recycled through all sorts of different things. So all of the atoms that are the building blocks of living things are a part of that biogeochemical cycle. The most common of these is called the carbon and the nitrogen cycles, which we're going to discuss next. Now, the carbon cycle describes the flow of carbon through an ecosystem. Carbon is one of these ones that is one of those basic building blocks of all living things. And so it's constantly in cycle. So carbon generally flows into the plants from CO2 in the air. They absorb that CO2 to make sugar using photosynthesis. Then animals eat those plants and absorb the carbon. And when the animals die, it goes back into the soil or it's back in the air from decomposing gases. Then it goes from the air to the oceans, as well as back to the plants. And you can see that there's this cycle of flow. The CO, the carbon, the CO2, the animal respiration, it all goes in and out. Now, one of the things you can see here is that there is an outside um, factor that was not always there. And that is auto and factory emissions is making additional CO2 can disrupt the carbon cycle. This is part of the reason for global warming, for the increase in carbon loading, you know, carbon neutrality, things that you've probably heard of, is because if you disrupt the carbon cycle, you end up with too much carbon in some places and not enough in others. So well, this is one of these things that we have to be mindful of because excess fossil fuel usage can disrupt the carbon cycle. In a similar way, all living things need nitrogen. For the uh, Most living things need nitrogen. And the nitrogen cycle describes the flow of nitrogen through the ecosystem. Now, most nitrogen in our world is in our atmosphere. It's 79% nitrogen, but it's not available to us directly. Because it's bound up in nitrogen gas, you can't do much with it. Even if you're inhaling it, you can't do anything with it. But plants can absorb nitrogen from the soil you know, through the nitrates, and um, they see the nitrates in the sun, they go straight to the plant consumption. They'll, and then animals obtain nitrogen by eating those organic molecules containing nitrogen. Then when animals die, their bodies release that nitrogen back into the soil and the cycle continues. Now, chemical fertilization, which you can see here, is when we need to add fertilization to plants to increase their growth rate, it can disrupt the nitrogen cycle by having huge amounts of nitrogen dumped into rivers and oceans that cause a feeding frenzy of plants, but then suck up all the oxygen. So we're in a very careful cycle here. As you can see that it goes through ammonium, nitrates, nitri nitrites, then nitrates, then back to plants, and it goes round and round it goes to keep that whole system in balance. Now, in an ecosystem, there are several factors and dynamics that affect that ecosystem. So first, let's just talk about biotic factors. So this is the living components of an ecosystem. You know, that's the bacteria, the birds, any other living thing that lives in an ecosystem is a biotic factor, which is obviously significant. But then there are also abiotic factors, things that are not living. So that's chemical or physical, such as soil or pH or forest fires, things like that that are not biologically driven, but obviously affect the dynamics of the ecosystem. Within abiotics, you really have three subgroups. That's climactic factors. So that's, you know, climate driven, sunlight, humidity, temperature, atmosphere, edaphic factors. That's the nature and the top type of the soil, the geology of the land, etc. And social factors. So land use, water resources, etc. All of those are factors that will drive and change an ecosystem. We want to be aware of those. Now let's talk a little bit about biomes. So a biome is a large community of vegetation and wildlife adapted to a specific climate. Now biomes could contain many smaller ecosystems, but that all share climate conditions. So a biome is a little bit larger generally than a specific ecosystem. It's a type of ecosystem that you might find all around Earth. So we have five major types of biomes on Earth. So you have the aquatic biome, and this will be freshwater and marine and brackish, all those sort of things. Then grasslands, so like the American prairie, the African savanna, the Asian steppes, you know, these huge grass areas. Then forests, 
you know, tropical rainforest, temperate rainforest, you know, taiga, all those sorts of forest areas. Then you have, you have deserts. You have like hot, dry deserts, coastal deserts, which are more temperate but very dry. You can have cold deserts like in Antarctica where it never rains. All those fall under the desert category. And then tundra, which is sort of a specialized, it's this cold, treeless regions in the Arctic and the Antarctic. It's different enough to the other four that we do consider it's, a, it's its own biome. So let's talk about biodiversity. The varieties of life in the world or in a particular habitat or ecosystem is the biodiversity. How much variety is there in what you see? So it is critical to maintain the balance between the members of the ecosystem. This is why we want to package these things and see them as a group, that the diversity is important. Now, humans obviously can affect biodiversity by our population numbers and our use of land, our lifestyles, and we can cause damage to habitats for species. This is something many of us are aware of, but something that we must be thinking more about as is something that is a consequence of our growth. We have to realize how our actions affect biodiversity and the importance of maintaining what biodiversity is left on the Earth. And that completes Module 6 of Middle School Science, Ecosystems, Interactions, Energy, and Dynamics. Module 7 will cover hereditary, heredity, and biological evolution. Thank you so much.